Well hello everybody, I'm Quentin and welcome to this little uh, tutorial on scientific computing with Python and with Jupyter Notebooks. I hope you enjoy it. Before we start though, I wanted to make one point. This is a long video and I'm not expecting that anyone's going to watch it through in one continuous stretch. Um, so I could have broken it up into lots of shorter episodes, but I find that a little bit of a nuisance having to go through and find the right episode, work out where the next one is and so on. So I've done this as one long video, uh, but if you're watching it on YouTube or Vimeo or somewhere, it'll probably remember where you got to so you can come back and resume uh, from where you left off if you need to. And I'll also put into the description below the timestamps of the places where each section starts so that you can easily resume from where you left off if you need to do that. Okay, let's get started. Hello everybody, my name is Quentin and this is a session I call the Modern Lab Notebook, Scientific Computing with Jupyter and Python. Now, I'm going to assume that you are familiar with Python. If you haven't used Python at all, then you might want to go away and, and learn that first. Trust me, it'll be well worth your while. Um, this was originally a session that was uh, a lecture that I did for new researchers here in the University of Cambridge, uh, where we, we have various sessions where we introduce various tools which might be of use to people in their research careers, and uh, Jupyter is becoming very important, and I thought it would be good to provide a, a nice basic introduction to this. So you may have heard about these things called Jupyter Notebooks or IPython Notebooks, and you may be wondering what's the difference between these and other ways of programming in Python. So this is what we're going to try and cover in this session. Now, there are times when, if you're writing code, you want it to look like this. You know basically what you're producing. You want a nicely architected chunk of organized code uh, to achieve a particular result. You're producing a product, essentially. But there are times where you may be less certain of your final destination, where you've got some data uh, you want to explore, you're not quite sure what's in it, uh, you're not quite sure of the best way of processing it, and you need a, a kind of playground for, for playing with data and with algorithms and, uh, and, and trying different things out. And that's really what Jupyter Notebooks are. You can think of them in, in three different ways, maybe. You can think of them as, as I say, this playground for exploring uh, code and, uh, and data and, um, and, and see, finding out the best way to accomplish things. Or you can think of it as code with a narrative, chunks of code with perhaps bits of description, maybe some diagrams, maybe some equations between the chunks of code uh, so that somebody else coming and looking at your code can see what you did and why. Um, but you can think of these as a bit of a transformation in scientific publishing. It's, it's always been important in any kind of publishing to make clear what your data is, where it came from, what your assumptions are, where you're starting. But of course, it's also important to explain your methodology, what you did with that data, how you came to your conclusions from it. And in more and more areas of science, um, that methodology involves code. It involves software. And so what we need for the scientific community is a good, portable, self-documenting way to distribute your algorithms, to distribute your ideas, so that other people can read this code and see the results and how you got from the inputs to the outputs, um, even if they don't have an environment in which they can run your original code uh, and recreate that original environment. So this is a kind of narrative about what you did with your data, why, how, uh, and uh, hopefully in a slightly more human readable form than just a large chunk of code would be. So what's our plan for today? I'm going to switch to and fro between uh, describing and explaining Jupiter and the environment and demonstrating it, a lot of demonstrating. Um, and my aim is to go from, you know, pretty much complete basics. What constitutes a NumPy array and how is it different from a standard Python array and so on? Um, uh, up to giving you some, some real examples of it in use. But prepare to be underwhelmed here. I'm not doing anything flashy. My aim here is to give you a really solid understanding and a whole sort of goodie bag of, of hints and tips and things that I wish people had told me before I started so that if you do decide you want to use this stuff, uh, you can hit the ground running with a lot of background knowledge. And if you don't decide you want to use it, then at least if somebody else shows you what they're working on, you'll be able to understand uh, what's going on and what they're doing. So we're going to look at Jupyter Notebooks, uh, this environment for, for writing code. We're going to look at NumPy, the numerical processing libraries for Python, on which a lot of this and other um, 
Python work like machine learning is often based on. And we're going to look at Pandas, which is a numerical data analysis library uh, for Python. Just a brief look at Pandas to give you an idea of, uh, of, of what that adds to the, the underlying NumPy stuff. But first of all, a bit of history. So in the beginning, there was this thing called IPython, Interactive Python. And you probably know that uh, you can just run the Python command at a command line and you can type in Python code. And uh, IPython was an enhanced version of that interpreter, which allowed you to do things like um, it did a bit more syntax checking. It gave you more help. It did auto completion. It was basically just a nicer environment if you were interacting with Python on the command line. And that still exists and you can install it and you can run it and it's quite nice. But it's hard on the command line to deal with more than one or two lines of text at a time. And of course, it is just text. It doesn't include any graphics or, or anything more visual. And so the next stage was that somebody created a Qt-based, a GUI-based console for IPython, which could do a few other things like um, embed some graphics. Now, uh, they realized here that the best way to do this was to have, uh, this was just a different front end to the same essentially language, Python language engine running in the background. So they created this concept of a Python kernel, a back end that could run code, and then you could have different front ends, whether they be text consoles or graphical consoles in front of it. And when web technologies became good enough, the concept of the IPython notebook began to emerge. And the idea here is that um, you can use a browser as a front end for this kernel, and we'll go into how this works a little bit more. Uh, and so you can get all the benefits of, uh, of working in a browser. You have these, these cells, which are basically, you know, chunks of code which are, you can manipulate with more than one line at a time, and you can take advantage of all the things that browsers offer, like links and graphics and so on. Now, IPython notebooks uh, became very popular and other people saw them and wanted to use them, including people who weren't necessarily Python programmers. And it was realized that this model of writing code in chunks like this um, and seeing the output uh, embedded in a page amongst the code was something that didn't need to be restricted to Python. And so Python became Jupyter, and Jupyter originally stands for Julia, Python, and R, which were some of the earliest languages that made use of this. Um, and the underlying architecture is that you, the user, are typing into a browser. Uh, the web page that browser is displaying comes from a thing called a notebook server, uh, which can also save those pages to a file on disk. Uh, and then it passes the chunks of code that you want to execute to a language kernel in the background, which may be Python, but it could be Julia or R, or in fact, it could be Lua, or it could be Bash. You can write Bash scripts with this. It could be Prolog or Scala or JavaScript or Haskell or PHP or Perl or Octave or MATLAB or even some compiled, normally compiled languages like Go and C Sharp. Uh, it could be the front end for some less languagey systems like Redis. Um, it could be Python 2 or Python 3 or different Python installations on the same machine and virtual ends. Essentially, that's just to name a few. So basically, this model of typing things into a notebook-like page and having chunks of it executed by a kernel um, can be applied whatever your language is. And also, of course, the fact that here and here you can put networks between these various different components allows for a great deal of flexibility. Your notebook server may be running uh, on a machine that's at some distance from the browser where you're actually interacting with it. Um, so why might you want to use this notebook model rather than some of the other options, say a commercial um, software package like MATLAB? Well, the first thing is it's Python. It's a good programming language. Um, it's widely used. It's very popular. It's well known. It's free. It's fun. Um, and as they say, it comes with batteries included. You get a huge amount of libraries that you can use in your notebooks simply because it's Python and it comes with all of these extras. Um, but increasingly, this is becoming a standard. Everybody else is doing it. So this is something you at least need to know about, even if you decide this isn't the way you want to, to go yourself. Um, another thing is that 
if you use something like MATLAB, often you use it in an environment where you're not actually paying for it. But if you do find yourself needing to pay for it, suppose your research leads to a new startup company and uh, you based it on MATLAB and you need to buy copies of MATLAB for all of your employees, it's actually fairly expensive. And this is at the time I was uh, writing this, I just had a quick look. It's about £1,800 for a license for MATLAB. That's a little over $2,000 at the moment. And, um, and if you have to get that for each of your employees, it's a fairly significant investment. So you need to think about, no, I've got nothing against MATLAB. It's a great, great system. But you need to think about whether it really offers um, so much that uh, you want to use that instead. And if you publish your work as MATLAB, then you're requiring everybody else who might want to look at it to have made that same kind of financial investment. Whereas Jupyter, you can get very easily and for free. You, if you have a Python environment already on your system, you can use pip uh, to install Jupyter. And you may also want to install some of the other libraries we're going to look at, like NumPy and Matplotlib and Pandas. If you're on Windows, I'm less familiar with this world, but you may want to use something like Anaconda to install it. You can use Anaconda on other platforms as well. Um, Anaconda has the big advantage that you get everything compiled all nicely to work together. It has the disadvantage that you then have a less standard Python installation at the end of it. Some people love it, some people are less keen on it. Uh, I'll leave that decision to you. But if you already have a Python environment set up with either of these systems, it's usually fairly easy to get Jupyter working in that world. So from here on, pretty much, we're going to switch into actually using Jupyter for the rest of our work. So let's take a look at what it looks like. Right, so let's assume that you have Jupyter successfully installed on your system and you need to start it up. Well, the way you start Jupyter Notebook is, perhaps surprisingly, by typing Jupyter Notebook. If you type this a lot, you might want to create an alias or a shortcut like I do. I normally just type JN. But I'm going to run this and what we should see is switching to a browser which shows you something like this. I'll make this a bit bigger. So let's just switch back and see what happened in the console here. Um, basically, the Jupyter Notebook server is running. It's ru created a little web server on your machine, localhost on port 8888 here. And uh, here's a special token which your browser needs to get access to that particular server. If you don't know that, you can't get in just to make sure that nobody unauthorized can get to your thing. So it will it will try and run this and open your browser to connect it to you, this URL. And uh, if it doesn't, you can come back and you can just copy this, this line into your browser. But we were successful here. And what you're seeing here basically is just a listing of my current directory. Um, and these things with IPYNB extensions are IPython notebooks or Jupyter Notebooks here. So we're going to work through these here and uh, there are various other things like images and so on here that we're going to use as demonstrations for some of this stuff. But let's go straight into the introduction and here we are in a Jupyter Notebook. So let's just go through this. These are the different cells here. You can see they're highlighted here. Uh, I'm going to just start in this one here where you can write standard Python. You can edit this cell as you would expect. It's sort of like a cell in a spreadsheet only kind of on steroids. And you can execute what's in this cell by doing shift return or shift enter. So that's just run those two commands just as it would if you type them into a regular Python console. And uh, if I do this, um, x is 4 pi, and you take the square root of 2x, uh, you get some output. So when you execute a cell, the last thing that is executed, if it produces any output, then the notebook will display that. Um, and uh, so cells, a bit like a spreadsheet, but uh, much, much better. You can have different types of cells here. So this is a cell with some text in it. This is a cell with code in it. And in fact, uh, the cells with text in are normally markdown. So if I double click in this, then you're editing markdown text. Uh, and uh, it can include latex style equations here. And when I do shift return, then you get the rendering of that. So shift return in a uh, code cell will run the code and you can do it in different orders. You can go back and run these things again if you like. And uh, shift return in a, in a markdown cell will render that markdown or do nothing if it's already rendered. So there are two different modes that your notebook can be in. There's command mode where you're 
basically doing things to cells um, and then there's edit mode where you're editing things within cells so to give you an example here I can type in command mode I can type X to cut that cell or I can type V to paste that cell whereas if I if I click within it and you'll see that this border changes from blue to green now we're in edit mode so now we're editing stuff within the cells and clicking in a cell or double clicking in a cell will take you into edit mode um, and so I can then do shift return I can do shift return actually in either either case and I can run this particular cell which is going and getting the HTML of my home page and it displays the output here, the, the, the contents. That's rather long, but if I click on the side here of, of the output window, I can change it into a scrolling, uh, scrolling window so it doesn't take much space, or indeed, if I double click, I can hide it altogether. So if your output's taking too much of the screen, um, that's a handy way to hide it. So here are some basic operations. A lot of these things, by the way, can be done by going to the menu or the toolbar, but it's well worth learning some of these basic keystrokes because they will make life a great deal easier. So I'll do it up here. If I'm in the edit mode, like green like this, if I press escape, then I go to the blue command mode and like my up and down keys will then move me between cells. If I press return, that's like double clicking on the cell and that takes me into it. So you can, using return and escape, you can switch between editing what's in a cell and doing things to the cells themselves. Um, really useful one, which a lot of people don't know, is that when you're in this command mode, if you type A, that will insert a new cell before the current one, like that. And if you type B, that will insert a new cell when you're in, not in edit mode. If you type B, that will insert a new cell after the current one. And you can do that several times, and that gives you empty cells to play with. Um, you can, as we saw, you can use X, C, and V when you're in command mode to cut a cell, and then to, or to copy it, and V to paste it back again. And if you type DD, that will delete cells to tidy them up again. So those are the, the most important keystrokes really. Uh, return to go into a cell, escape to get out into command mode. In command mode you can use A and B to add cells before or after where you are. You can use cut, copy and paste on cells by typing X and V and double D to delete them. Now, we saw here that when you execute a cell, let me just put something in here like 2 plus 3. When you do Shift-Enter, you execute the cell and you move on to the next one. So you can just keep doing Shift-Enter and you'll move through your, um, through your notebook executing all of the cells. But there are other options. So, for example, if I'm in here and I do Control-Enter, I have actually executed that, uh, uh, but I've stayed in the same place, so I can execute it again. A, a way to demonstrate this is, let's add an extra cell, and we'll say x equals 1, and we'll say um, x equals x plus 1, and we'll print the value of x, right? So if I do Control-Enter, oh, let me set this first, I'm going to go up here. I'm going to do shift enter to execute that and if I do control enter then I've executed that but I've stayed in the same place so I can just keep hitting control enter and we're running that over and over again and you can see the output incrementing here. Okay. Um, alt enter or alt return or option return on a Mac basically executes that cell and creates a new one underneath for you so if you're going back up into a notebook um, option enter is a handy way to keep working there while, while the stuff underneath moves down. Uh, we'll skip these. These were demos of, of some of the things I've already shown you. Um, you can merge cells. So if, I, if I've got these two cells here, if I go into this one and uh, in command mode and I do shift M, that will merge the two cells. And again, you can do this sort of thing uh, with merge cell above and below. You can split cells. There are shortcuts for these kind of things. Split a cell like that into two and so forth. And um, if you want to know a lot more about all of these shortcuts, on the help menu there is a keyboard shortcuts thing which will show you lots of the important ones. And in fact you can also um, edit the keyboard shortcuts here if you want to change them to something else. There's also lots of useful reference information here uh, which we may come back to later. So a key thing to understand is that there's one underlying Python kernel behind each of your 
uh, Jupyter Notebooks. In fact, if I go back to my home screen here, you can see here is my Jupyter Notebook and it tells you that it's running. There is a kernel running here and in fact you can see only the ones that are running and, you, uh, and it tells you what it's running and you can shut it down and so on. So however many views you may have onto this notebook, it is just one kernel behind the scenes. So the order in which I run things, this is a lot, when I, when I shift return here, this is a lot like typing it into a Python prompt. And, uh, and something happens there. But if I go up here and run this, uh, then uh, the order in which it appears in the notebook is not important. It's the order in which the things are executed. So yes, if you run through your notebook executing them in order, that's as if they were being typed in order into a, a Python prompt. But it is important to notice that um, these values are preserved because they are just variables that are set in the Python kernel and they will be there uh, unless you decide to restart the kernel um, which you can do here you can restart and clear the output of, uh, of all your cells you can restart and run all of your cells or you can just restart the kernel so if I if I restart now I'll lose all of my current variables and actually let's do a restart and clear output this is a good idea from time to time this gets you back to a sort of pristine cell and if I now run this I will get an error because the name X isn't defined <laughs> we have a new fresh kernel and you can't add one to X if you don't know what X is already so uh, let's go up here and run that and then run that and then that'll work if you to give you an idea so there are various magic commands that you can run in these cells, often started with percent. So if I uncomment this and I run this, this will load the file q.py into here. And that's from the current directory. So that's a quick way to get some existing code into, your, into one of your cells. Uh, this is part of a um, uh, uh, Python module I created for the Philips Hue light bulbs. And... Uh, you can see here that it leaves your load command commented out at the top of the, the screen, but it's loaded all of the code in and you can run that just as you could uh, on the command line if you want to. Um, you can also put an exclamation mark, a bling, on the front of uh, a command and that lets you run normal shells commands like ls or dir presumably if you're on Windows. So if I run that, that will list the IP MB files on, um, uh, in my current directory. And in fact, in my case, I can take one of these, these IPMP files, and I'm going to use, I use Visual Studio Code as my editor at the moment. So if I run that, I, this will open in my editor. I'll switch to here, bear with me. And you can see that an IPMB file is actually a just a JSON file, uh, which has for each cell uh, information about the type of the cell and what's in it and possibly the output of it as well. So when you save a cell, you can see that um, the output by default will get saved as part of that as well. Uh, and so these are text files. They're easy to email to people, to copy onto sticks, to, to hand around, to put onto, uh, onto servers and allow people to download. So you can just send people IPMB files and uh, They'll contain your input and perhaps your output. And this, um, you have to remember that your output may be very large. And that can actually, if you've got big images and so on, or big tables embedded in the output of your um, your notebook, that may make it rather big. And you may decide that actually before saving it or sending to somebody, you want to take all of the outputs and clear them just so it's a much smaller, uh, much smaller file. Or perhaps before checking it into version control or something. But there are other ways you can share your notebooks as well. So um, there's, for example, there's a command called nbconvert. Uh, sorry, let me render that. There's a command called nbconvert, which will convert notebooks to things like static HTML pages or PDFs or just output them as a Python script and so on. Um, there, if you save notebooks on GitHub or Bitbucket, um, they know how to render them. There's a library called NB Viewer, which you can go to and you can just put in the URL of uh, a notebook that you've got online somewhere and it will render that. There are also, now, now these, these things all tend to produce static versions because of course there's no Python uh, engine behind them executing your code, but there are options for that as well. There are things like there's a system called Binder, which will let you actually fire up a Docker container running a uh, 
Python world and give you a temporary uh, environment in which to run notebooks so you can sort of enable this for people who actually want to run the code as well. And if you're providing, if you want to provide a Jupyter Notebook server to lots of local people on your environment, there are projects like Jupyter Hub, which will do this and essentially provide a, a set of pages and allow different users to, to create their own pages and so on in classroom situations. So those are just some examples. There are many more. Now, here's an important thing to understand, and I apologize for introducing this complexity so early in our discussions, but it can be a source of confusion, so bear with me, and if this is too complicated or you don't get it, then don't worry, you can skip it and come back to it later. But the key thing is, when you ran that Jupyter Notebook command to fire up this world, what you were doing was you were using an environment, a Python environment, that knows how to run Jupyter. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same Python environment that is actually running this notebook. In most cases, in simple cases, it will be. But remember, your notebook doesn't even have to be in Python. The language that's running your notebook may be something completely different. Often it will be Python, but it's not necessarily the same Python world as the thing that you use to fire up your Jupyter notebook server. So it's important to bear that in mind, particularly if, say, you have different versions of Python on your machine, or you perhaps use virtual ENVs to have uh, an environment, different environments that, uh, that contain different libraries and so on. So let's just look at, at this concept of a language kernel, a Python kernel in this case, and what it actually means. So we've seen that you can put a pling on the front, an exclamation mark on the front of a regular shell command, and in a sort of Unixy world, this will tell you where the Python is that is on your path that you would run if you just typed Python at, at the command line. And in my case, I am running one that's in a virtual end, so it's in this slightly strange location here. Now, this actual notebook, you can find out where the Python is that's running in any given Python program by importing the sys module and looking at sys.executable. And in my case, these are the same thing, but they don't have to be. Right? The thing that's running this uh, notebook, the kernel that's running this notebook, you can choose, actually, from here. You can switch between different kernels. I have different ones for different projects. Well, some are Python 2, some are Python 3. This is the one I'm running at the moment. And... Um, so if I do things, for example, like pip install numpy, which is a perfectly valid command, I've already got numpy installed, but it's important to note that that is actually installing it in this Python, the one that, you know, the same, the same world that I ran my Jupyter Notebook from, not necessarily the Python that's actually running this notebook. And if you do want to install that, um, then you can use this sys.executable that we saw earlier. When you're running in a, a shell command, you can use curly brackets to put in the name of normal Python variables. And this is actually a way to make sure that you are saying um, running the Python that's running this notebook, using the pip module, and saying install numpy into that world. Again, in my case, they're both the same, but if you have multiple Python environments, it's worth noticing that you might do a pip install numpy before you come into the Jupyter notebook and then find that numpy isn't actually there. This is a good way to make sure that it really is. Okay, a little bit of complexity. If you do want to know more about how you create these different kernels and different environments and multiple versions of Python on the same machine, a quick summary is you want to look for this ipy kernel command, I don't want to wait. let me execute that. This IPy kernel module, and you can basically say I want to install a new kernel in my user space. I want to call it that lab notebook, and I want to display lab notebook lecture up on the right here. And there are commands which will list the different kernels you have installed. In my case, there are the several of them, and what those are is basically directories uh, within your system which have within them a kernel jot json file and if i just pick my current one here what have i got uh qsf qs101 on here uh, you can see this is what is actually in one of those kernel definitions it's got a name it's the language is python here 
and here's the command that's run. It's a particular Python interpreter uh, and some a module that you need to run and a few other bits of information. Uh, but that's just a little more detail than most people will want, but that is the definition of the thing that's running this particular notebook. Hopefully, for most of you, you won't have to worry about that. Let's get back to the important stuff. So the last thing we're gonna mention about a, um, I, uh, a Jupyter notebook is that of course there is a Python process that's running that's processing this and when you've finished running it you may want to close that process down and there are various ways you can do it but you can go file close and halt here if you want to tidy up your world beforehand you might like to do cell clear all of the output of my cells oh there we go just so it doesn't all get saved and then I'm going to do close and halt and that's basically killed off the kernel and I'm going to leave the page here and you can see that the thing that was running in the past is no longer running now. The overall Jupyter server is still running and in fact if I switch back to my uh, shell here you can see it's still there and it saved that file and so on but the um, but there's no individual kernels running for individual notebooks. Okay that's the very basics. Sorry that wasn't a lot of fun but that helps you understand a little bit more about the environment in which this world is running. Now we get on to the serious stuff. Right, so we've looked at the basics of Jupyter Notebooks. You know what they look like, you know how to edit them, you know how they run. Um, we're now going to move on and look at NumPy, the numerical processing library which underlies a lot of scientific computing in Python. Um, but you may have seen all you want to see. If you just want to know about Jupyter Notebooks, you don't need to use any of this. Do hang around because it's kind of interesting, but uh, and it might turn out to be very useful for you. But um, you can, of course, just do regular Python in Jupyter Notebooks, and I often do this, right? I use it as a, well, as a quick calculator. I use it to try out ideas. I use it for sort of brief scripts, which maybe I need to do something on my server and I need to write a little bit of documentation to remind myself what it's doing and why and have some inputs and so on that I may want to change in future. So it's not quite throwaway code, but it's also not a fully fledged program. Uh, I hope that what you've learned so far will be useful, even if that's all you want to do. NumPy uh, comes from numpy.org. You can find it and all of its details there, but you can just pip install it uh, like the other packages. And um, we're going to go and run through some notebooks uh, showing it and how it works. Um, uh, and I should mention that all of the notebooks I'm using in this session are available from GitHub uh, at quentinsf slash lab notebook. So you can find them there if you want to follow along or because I'm moving fairly fast, you may want to try these yourselves later. OK, so here we are back in our directory as served up by my Jupyter notebook server. I'm going to Click on the second one here, NumPy. Now a couple of things to say about notebooks in general before we carry on. Um, one thing is that if you're looking at this, you may find that particularly the top here looks a little different from uh, what I'm seeing here. Now that's because the header at the top, you can turn on and off like this if you don't need to see it. And there's also a toolbar which can appear here. I tend not to bother with that because Essentially, I do most of what's in here through keystrokes, but you may find it useful. Um, you can also, if you want to, turn on line numbers um, for the cells that have multiple lines. Most of mine are short enough that I don't bother with that. So that's one thing uh, that may make your screen look different from mine. Um, another thing to mention here is how do you save this stuff? Well, in general, you don't need to because um, the background Jupyter Notebook process will checkpoint them for you. And you can see up here, it tells me that this was last saved a minute ago. But um, you can actually save it if you want to by hitting Command S or I guess Control S probably on Windows. Uh, and that will cause it to, to save if the auto saving isn't frequent enough for you. Right, so let's get into playing with NumPy. Uh, as we've said, it's available from numpy.org, but normally you'll just pip install it. And again, as we discussed earlier, remember that if you haven't done this before you start, you may want to pip install it into the environment that is actually behind the kernel that's running your Jupyter world here. So what does NumPy give you that Python doesn't already have? Well, of course, Python has a huge amount, uh, but NumPy gives you a whole lot more. Let's start by looking at arrays, which are really what NumPy gives you. Very, very flexible and fast ways of dealing with arrays of numbers and, um, and performing operations on them. Uh, 
But let's start with a simple Python array, or Python has lists which you can basically use as arrays, and we can define one like this. And you'll see this quite often where you um, uh, assign something to a variable and then just put it on the last line so that Jupyter prints out the value. Um, we're going to import NumPy here. Now, um, you can just import NumPy, but to save typing, it's a very common convention that people will import it as NP. So you'll often see that as the as the standard way to uh, to include it in your code. And we can create a NumPy array here. Um, you calling the NP uh, dot array constructor here with I'm going to give it exactly the same data, and you'll see that we end up with something that uh, looks very similar. So you'll notice that I've cunningly called my Python array P and my NumPy array N here, so we can compare them. So for example, with a Python array, as I'm sure you know, you can uh, slice it up using these uh, the colon operator. So we have, um, this says I want to go from element zero to just before element two here, which gives me the one and the two at the beginning, or I can ask for the length of this array, which is five. And I can do exactly the same stuff with the NumPy array. It returns me another NumPy array, but with the same elements in it, and I can ask for the length of it. And I can do the kind of things you might expect to do with a Python array, like uh, for i in the array, then print the value of i. And that does pretty much what you'd expect with the Python array. But then things start diverging a little bit. So Python doesn't really have two-dimensional arrays or even multi-dimensional arrays. You can basically create them by having lists of lists like this. So there is um, a Python list containing two lists, and so you can get the second element of the first list by uh, doing that. And this is all you're doing. You're saying, show me the first of my the first element in my outer list, and then the second element with that, and sure enough, we get the two here. But NumPy does know about multidimensional arrays, so I can create one like this, and it even knows how to print it out and make it look pretty. And I can actually ask for n0, 1, which should give me the same thing, but with a comma between it as you would sort of expect with uh, our traditional arrays. Uh, but you can actually still do what you would do in Python here, so very often the same code is compatible. Um, uh, regardless of whether you're using a Python array or a NumPy array. Uh, what you're actually doing here, of course, is you are getting a the first uh, the first row of this um, array is being returned as another NumPy array, which you're then slicing up um, to get the second element of it. Similarly, in Python arrays, we mentioned the colon operator and so on. If we look at, uh, say, the first row of our two-dimensional array here, I can then ask for everything from the second element, element one, uh, up to just before the fourth element, which is the five on the end here. And I can go at a stride of two, which means take every other one. So in this case, this will give us the two and the four here. And um, in this is a normal Python array, of course, still, and you can leave some of these things out. So for example, I can, this assumes the first element if you don't say it, and this will take you to um, an element before the end, just before an element before the end, so that gives me um, uh, 1, 2, and 3. That's standard Python. In NumPy, you can do the same kind of thing. So reminder, here's my NumPy array. And what I'm going to do here is, in the first dimension, i.e. the rows, I am uh, asking for, essentially this is from the zeroth element to the end, I can leave them both out. So this colon just becomes a placeholder to basically say, everything in this dimension. And then here I'm going to say from the zeroth element to the end but with a stride of two, so take every other element. And so what you get back is essentially every other element in the columns but getting both rows back here um, in the array. So you can do slicing arrays with the colon operator much the same way as you can in Python but you have a bit more power here as well. We'll come back to that and talk more about what's different later. So we've seen one way of creating arrays up here by calling the np.array function, but there are lots of other ways you can do it. So if you want a big array, uh, you can use the array range, a range function here. This will give me a 2000 element array going from zero to 1999. Uh, and these are integers, but they don't have to be. I can say I want to go from 0, 0.0 to just before 9.0 with a st step of 0.3, for example, and that will give me uh, that array. 
If I just need a whole load of ones, I can do that. You often need this if you want to uh, do certain mathematical operations. Um, or I can ask for zeros as well in a similar way. And these, by the way, are, are coming through as floats, but you may uh, you can actually specify the data type that you want to have. So NumPy has a whole load of different data types. Uh, again, we'll see why uh, being so specific is sometimes useful. We're saying here this is a 16-bit integer, and uh, you can't really tell there other than the fact that it tells you, but these are all integers, uh, and they are, in fact, unsigned 16-bit integers here. Um, you can create a diagonal array here where only the elements on the diagonal are set. Um, and if you want bigger ones, you can do things like tiling, for example. So here I'm going to take the value of pi and I'm going to tile it uh, to 10 rows by 5 columns. Uh, there we go. And um, so you can tile an individual value like that. Or if you have something like the diagonal array uh, we created earlier, I want to tile that three by three times. Then you can see here's my diagonal array just up to that little bit. And it's been repeated three by three times. So tile is quite a useful one. And um, uh, another thing you can do, and this turns out to be really quite common and, and useful, is you can reshape an array. So here I'm going to take uh, the range array that we did before of 120 elements, 0 to 119, and I'm going to reshape that into an array that is 12 rows by 10 columns, and you can see there that we get uh, those numbers. And um, I'm just dealing with two-dimensional arrays here because it gets harder to display this stuff, but actually you can have lots of uh, dimensions if you want to. I think NumPy out of the box comes with up to 32 dimensions if your brain can hold that much, and uh, you can recompile it if you, need, if you need more than that. Now, when we do simple operations on arrays, it, they operate element-wise across the whole array. So, for example, here's my little array. 1, 2, 3. If I add 40 to that, it goes through each element and adds 42 to each element and gives me another array, array back. I can multiply as well. So this shows that NumPy arrays are not always quite the same as Python arrays. So for example, here's that list 1, 2, 3 in Python. If you multiply that by 3, what you get is three copies of the list. Um, because it is a list, it's not really an array, and these things get lists uh, basically get appended to each other if you do a, multiple, a multiplication like that. So uh, we start to see places where you can do things with NumPy arrays that you can't necessarily do with, with Python lists and vice versa. Um, so, for example, these simple operators will work as expected on each element of the array, but there are some things you can't do like that. So uh, if we look at our NumPy array here, and we try to import the math module and do the sign of each element there, then we get a strange error back. Only size one arrays can be converted to, Py converted to Python scalars. So what's actually happening here is that the sign function expects an integer or a float, and um, NumPy will actually automatically convert a value that it has into a NumPy or float if it can, or Python will do it, um, but it doesn't know what to do there if there's a, uh, if, if it's not just a one by one array, that wouldn't make sense. So um, if something is expecting a standard Python scalar, then you can't necessarily apply it to a, a NumPy array. What you're really trying to do here perhaps is something like this construction in Python where you say sine of i for i in n and that does sort of work. And if you really wanted to, you could then convert that back into an array by doing this, but that's a little bit cumbersome. Uh, that's like, probably what you were expecting to achieve when you did that, uh, and that doesn't quite work. But fortunately, NumPy has this huge array of functions that will work on arrays, and um, if you look in here, you'll see there in, in the NumPy documentation, you'll see there are lots and lots of categories. Some of these contain uh, very large numbers of functions themselves. So, for example, here's our NumPy array. I can ask for the NumPy sign function and apply that to the array, and sure enough, it will do exactly what we did, and we get the same values as we had up here. Um, you can do this with more complicated things. So I can take the NumPy array, multiply each element by 10, convert that value from degrees to radians, take the sign of it, and so we should get 10, 20, 30 degrees expressed as signs, and there you go, sine of 30 degrees is 0.5. Now, why would you want to do this when you've got a lot of this in Python? 
Well, one key reason is just performance here. So let's make a big array. Here's a feature you might not know in Python 3. Um, you can put underscores in your numbers to make them more readable. That only works in Python 3. Uh, but it's easier to see here that I'm making a list that is uh, a million elements long. I'm asking for the range, so this will go from naught to a million minus one. And I'm not going to print that out because Python doesn't do a very good job of realizing that that's a very large number of things to print out. NumPy is a little uh, more sane, so if I use the a range function here and ask for a range with a million elements, then uh, print it out, it will just show me the first few and the last few. Now, there are some handy magic commands. We saw one earlier in the previous section. Um, I'm going to use here the time function here. So this will tell me the time taken to execute this cell. So what I'm going to do is for my big Python array here, this list of a million numbers, I'm going to multiply each number by 10, uh, take the radians of it, uh, do the maths of it, and store the result as a big list. Let's run that, and we can see that it's really pretty quick. Uh, it takes about a third of a second here, and the system is actually using 12 milliseconds to do that. Let's do the same in the NumPy world. So I've got my big NumPy array here. I'm going to multiply each number by 10, use the NumPy degrees to radians, and NumPy.sign to run it. And you can see here that it was um, it took half the time here in terms of the system time, uh, considerably less user time. And um, in fact, once you've done it once, certain things get cached. If I run that again, you can see it's now taking one millisecond. It's about 10 times as fast, roughly. Um, and this is not unusual. If you can turn your operations that maybe in Python are, are loops effectively uh, across a large number of elements into things that operate on the array as a whole in NumPy, you can get very big speed ups and you know, uh, 5, 10, 20 times as fast is not unusual. So that makes a really big difference. Let's look at this more carefully. So I'm going to do these assignments. I'm going to create sign P and sign N here, same way as we did before. Then I'm going to add up all of the values in sign P, so all of those million signs. Um, just run that for a little while. But here I've got the time it command on the beginning. So what that actually does is run this loop multiple times to take a certain amount of sensible time for you to sit around waiting. And you can see here it actually ran 100 loops. Uh, it did seven runs within each of those loops, and it's giving me the mean plus minus standard deviation of how long each loop took. So again, we can see three and a bit milliseconds here, and uh, plus or minus seven microseconds. So that's the Python version, just using sum on the list there. Let's do the equivalent in the NumPy world, and you'll see it takes about the same amount of time but that's because it did a thousand loops here where it only did a hundred loops there. So that ran through summing a million numbers. It did it 7,000 times and we can see here it took 300 microseconds per loop rather than three milliseconds per loop. So again, about 10 times as fast. Now, NumPy isn't always faster for everything you may want to do, particularly if it has to convert your, the inputs into NumPy arrays before it starts doing things with them. But quite often you'll see significant performance improvements. Now, here's a strange term, broadcasting. You will come across this, so it's important to understand it. Let's create two arrays here. N is going to be a short array, one, two, three. M is four, five, six. We can add those together. And when you do that, it adds each of the elements um, to the matching one in the other array. And you can do more complex, simpler uh, equations here, like n squared over root m minus n <laughs> with those two arrays, and I can do that. Um, but it's important that what, what's happening here is we are taking each individual element in n and m, and we're essentially performing these operations on the matching elements in the two arrays. So if the arrays are different sizes, this won't work generally. So if I make A, for example, be a three by three array here, yeah, and B be a three by two array, then we try and add A plus B and it says, operands couldn't be broadcast together with these shapes three, three and three, two. So what does this broadcasting actually mean? Well, from the documentation, the term broadcasting describes how NumPy treats arrays with different shapes during arithmetic operations. Subject to certain constraints, the smaller array is broadcast across the larger array so that they have compatible shapes. So what that means is, let's have a look at A here. A is 
three by three. Let's create an array which is three by one there. Now, if you try and add those two together, oh, it does work. And that's because it kind of makes sense that this tall, thin array of the same height as this one can kind of be spread across here. So you'll add, what we're doing is adding 10, 20, and 30 to the top, medium, and bottom element, top, middle, bottom element on each one. And that's sort of spread or swiped across here or broadcast across here. Um, and it makes sense to do that uh, because their shapes are in some sense compatible. Um, and this can sometimes be quite useful. Similarly, I can do A times B and you get the same effect here. Now, when can you do that? Well, essentially, it's whenever it makes sense to kind of swipe one array across the other one. So more strictly from the document, NumPy will look at the dimensions of the two arrays. It will start with the trailing dimensions and work its way forward. And these two dimensions will be compatible, i.e. you'll be able to do this broadcasting when either they're equal or when one of them is one. So let's have a look at this. Uh, we can use the shape um, uh, attribute of an array to find out its shape. A is three by three, B is three by one. And if we look at these rules, we start at the trailing dimension here. We work our way forward and we ask this question, either are they equal? No. But if one of them is one, yes, then that's okay. So these two can be broadcast there. Let's move forward to the next one. Are they equal? Yes. And so these two shapes can be broadcast across each other because essentially they're either the same shape or the last dimension is one, uh, which means that you can swipe one across the other. Um, and we're thinking in two dimensions here, but you may want to, in three dimensions, say swipe a square across a cube as it were. I think of wiping or swiping or something, but broadcasting is the correct term. So you'll see that. You can decide whether or not you want to use it, um, but it's important to understand that you can do things to arrays even if they're not the same shape. Now, it is important to remember that when you're doing stuff to arrays like this, you are doing it element by element for most of these operations. You are not, if you multiply two arrays like this, you're not doing a matrix multiplication. So, uh, you often want to do this, of course, and so NumPy does have specific functions to do this. So let's take a 3x3 three three array and a 3x2 array. Um, and so, I don't know why that's there. There is the dot command, you use dot often to indicate multiplication in, uh, in maths, so the NumPy dot uh, operator given two arrays will multiply them together, and you can see. Uh, three by three multiplied by uh, sorry a, a two by three multiplied by three by two gives you a two by two array uh, coming out. So you can do np dot dot and the two arguments, or if you prefer, you can use dot dot as a method on the first array to multiply by the second one. That does the same thing. Now, if you have a recent Python, I think this is about Python three point five or newer. There is actually a special new operator in Python for use by things like matrix multiplication. This gives you an idea of actually how important NumPy is in the Python world, that it was deemed that this would be useful and a matrix multiplication operator was added. Python doesn't directly do anything with this, but it means that extensions like NumPy can make use of it, so that is a matrix multiplication. If you want to do more complex matrix stuff, NumPy does have various subsections. The, the library has many modules within it uh, with all sorts of extra functionality. So here's the linear algebra one, for example, which can give you the eigenvalues of this array if I run that. So there's matrixy stuff there. Now, you may come across historic documentation, which points out that NumPy does actually have a matrix class as well as an array class, but it's not recommended. And this is mostly because uh, they ended up with two different classes that were similar but behaved in slightly different ways and it was a pain to maintain these and you wanted to make sure that you knew when you multiply two things together whether they're going to behave like arrays or whether they're going to behave like matrices. matrices. So um, use arrays, don't use the NumPy matrix class. If you want to do matrixy things, explicitly call the operator that, uh, that you need to do those. Okay, let's look at indexing, getting things out of arrays. So here's an array, the numbers from 10 to 29. And um, obviously we can index our way into this by doing things like, you know, get the first three elements here, element zero to just before three. 
Uh, and as we saw earlier, we can also do that with a stride. So we can say from, from the third element to just before the 15th element with a step of four, and that gives us uh, 12, 16, and 20 here. So that's fairly standard Python style indexing. Um, you can also pass in a list of values and it will give you those elements. So that'll give you elements one, three, and six, um, starting from zero. So those, those elements from the array. So you can use a list inside an array. This is, of course, different from Python. You can use a list inside an array like this to extract those elements. Now, one, we've seen various mathematical operations being applied to arrays. You can also apply things to arrays that um, return Boolean results. So if I, for example, A is an array, if I say A is greater than 14, it will tell me true or false for all of those elements, whether or not the value is greater than 14 at that point. And in the same way here, as we passed in a list of numbers, you can pass in a list of Booleans, uh, an array of Booleans, or a list of Booleans, and it will then return the elements for which the Boolean value is true. So you get this slightly strange syntax, which you'll get very used to when you play with this stuff a lot, but uh, is not familiar for those who are just used to regular Python, where we're saying, is A greater than 14? That returns a list, uh, a Boolean array. <laughs> And then we use that to index into a, uh, a itself, and that will basically give us the values of A for which A is greater than 14. Um, you can almost think of this, if you're familiar with databases, as a SQL query, uh, select from A where A is greater than 14. Here's another example. So we can do the modulo operator on an array. This gives us the remainder when each value of A is divided by 3. We can ask for the situations where uh, that is equal to zero, i.e. where the number is divisible by three. You can see we have trues here every third element. And so we can use that as an index into the array A, and we can get the values of that array. We can get another array coming out, the values of which are all of the numbers in A that are divisible by three. Again, I wanted to point that out because it'll be slightly unfamiliar syntax for those of you used to standard Python. Okay, well done. That tells you most of the basics you need to know about NumPy arrays and how they're different from Python arrays and some other things you can do with them. So now let's move on to having some fun with this. Most of what you've seen so far has been really very text-based, and I like looking at pictures, and you'll find that a lot of what NumPy and related technologies are used for, in fact, often involves images. It's machine learning based around images, it's image processing or um, computer vision. We're not gonna do any of that, but we are gonna give you the background here so that when you look at other code or other tutorials online, uh, you'll be able to understand a little bit more about what's going on behind the scenes. So let's have a look at some pictures. Okay, I'm going to fire up my images notebook here. And basically what we're gonna look at here is how images behind the scenes are often actually represented as NumPy arrays. So first of all, let's load some useful modules here. So I'm importing NumPy as NP, we've seen it before. I'm importing OpenCV as CV. I'm gonna import the matplotlib library and what most people do here is actually use the pyplot Submodule of this, uh, and again to save typing, it's very common to import it as plot. And then this little bit of magic here just makes the default size for images that matplotlib produces a little bit bigger. Uh, it'll just make them easier for our purposes here. You don't need to worry about what that does at the moment. There are various ways of doing it, but that's the way I tend to use. So let's do an ls for JPEGs and PNGs in my current directory, and you can see various images here. I'm going to pick this one called Craignish here. And I'm going to use OpenCV's image read uh, function, which brings in the image um, as a NumPy array, um, but in blue, green, red format. Now, uh, we want it in red, green, blue format, and so often uh, I use the uh, OpenCV convert color, which takes an image and some color conversion process. In this case, it's BGR to RGB, swaps the blue and the red around, and then we'll ask matplotlib to show this image, uh, and we'll stick a title on the bottom. So let's run that, and there you go. There's one of my holiday photos. Um, 
You'll note the semicolon on the end here. If you remember, the last thing in a notebook cell tends, when you evaluate it, uh, it tends to be printed out. If you don't put this here, then it will helpfully tell you that this last thing that it's putting on is a text title here called Craignish Scotland, uh, and you probably don't actually want to see that. So if you put a semicolon on the end, that's a handy trick for saying, don't display the last thing that's uh, in this cell. I think what actually happens is it runs this, semicolon moves you onto a new Python command, it then evaluates whatever comes after the semicolon, which is nothing, so it just keeps things a little bit tidier. Now, OpenCV images, as I said, are NumPy arrays. So if we look at that image, we'll see that basically you have this array of red, green, blue values here. And in fact, here you can see this is the top left corner, a little bit bluer than, uh, than the red and the green, and we would expect that here. Uh, up in the sky. Down here it's kind of browny. so um, if we go right to the very end here you can see that uh, it's slightly redder, a little bit greener than it is blue. So this all makes sense. And the data type here is an unsigned int, uh, an 8-bit unsigned int, so their value is from 0 to 255. Let's just look at the shape then of the image. Uh, we can see this is uh, 513 rows by 900 columns by three bytes, one each for red, green, and blue. Um, so this is a three-dimensional array. Now we know how to manipulate things in arrays. Uh, we saw that earlier. So we could have taken our BGR image and turned it into a red, green, blue image um, using the slicing techniques we did earlier. So if you remember, we can say colon just as a placeholder for everything in this dimension. Uh, that's in the uh, rows. We could do the same for columns. But when we get down to the RGB values for each individual pixel, we're going to go from the beginning to the end, but in the order minus one, i.e. read them backwards. So this will turn the red, green, blue with, uh, sorry, the blue, green, red within each individual pixel into the red, green, blue that we want. So we could actually have done the whole thing just like that. And that gets us the same result. Not necessarily clearer to read though. Now, the first axis in NumPy always identifies the row, normally identifies the row. So let's imagine we want to look at the bottom corner of this image down here. We can take the image, let's take all the rows from minus 200, i.e. from the end of minus 200, about there, um, downwards, and the columns going up to position 300. So that's this corner of that array, and let's just show that. And there you go, we see a zoomed in, because matplotlib will display it at roughly the size you've requested, a um, uh, bit of that corner of the, of the image there. So what's happening behind the scenes here again? Let's look at our image. The d-type we've seen is an unsigned int. It's a value between 0 and 255. Um, the size then of each individual item, this thing called item size, tells you how many bytes that takes up. One byte for one unsigned integer, 8-bit. Um, the shape of the image we've already seen here. Let's have a look at this thing called strides. Now strides in NumPy arrays tell you how many bytes you need in each of the dimensions to move on to the next element in that dimension. So if we work from the right here, to go from red to green to blue in a given pixel takes one byte. To go from one pixel on a row to the next pixel on a row takes three bytes. Uh, one for each of red, green and blue. And to go from one row to the same pixel on the next row takes 2,700 bytes because it's 900 wide and there are three bytes per pixel. So that all makes sense. Now let's look at our little corner down here. Sorry, those were from the original image here. Let's look at our little corner down here, um, where the shape here is only 200 uh, high by 300 wide by 3 pixels. Um, and if we look at the strides, you'll find that, ah, that's interesting, they're the same. Why are they the same? Why is it still 2,700 bytes to get from one row to the next when it's now only 300 pixels wide? And the answer is that when you slice up images like this, in fact many array operations in Python, uh, in NumPy, um, you're not actually copying or creating new chunks of memory, you are referring to the original memory in different ways. So an array actually has a special flag called own data, which says does it own its own data or does somebody else own it? And in the case of our little corner image here, no it doesn't own its own data, it is 
a view onto the same data that the image array uses, but it has a different offset and shape so that um, when you go from, uh, in fact, we've seen the shape here, the shape is different and actually the slight, slightly different starting point in memory, but the number of bytes you, you need to traverse to get from one pixel in one row to the same pixel in the next row is still the same amount because it's still the original uh, memory that is being used here, which is very efficient. Um, let's give you another example here. So let's just look at the red values of our image. We're going to take everything in the uh, columns, in the rows dimension, everything in the columns direction. We're just going to take the first of the RGB values, i.e. reds, and we'll have a look at the reds dot shape. That gives us an array that's just 513 by 900, uh, and we can transpose that, reds.t.shape, dot dot uh, which gives us an array that's 900 by 513. Again, we just have an unsigned 8-bit integer here, and we can plot reds, and you can see there that uh, this is now a grayscale image because we got rid of the color information. And so we need to tell um, matplotlib a color map, how are we going to convert those values from 0 to 255 into colors? And in this case, we're just going to treat them as grayscale values. Uh, and so as we do with reds, we can do with reds.t, the transpose, and we find the same thing transposed around the x equals y axis. And if we look at reds.strides, we can see that to go, as we've seen before, to go from um, one pixel to the next in the rows direction is 2700 bytes, three pixels, um, three bytes in the uh, x direction. Uh, and that's because reds is actually, even though we've sliced the array like that, reds is still referring actually to the same bit of memory. So it still takes three bytes. We haven't generated any new array here. This is uh, still looking at the data from our original image. So this stuff is very efficient. And um, so it does mean that we still need to go three bytes to get from uh, one pixel to the next pixel in the same row. And if we look at the reds.t.strides, uh, reds.t.strides rather, the transpose, again, we're still actually looking at the same bit of memory. It's simply that we've said to go from one pixel to the next one in the same column, you just go three pixels, uh, three bytes rather, and to go in the same row, you go 2700 bytes. So by swapping those two around, we basically simply um, uh, swap the order in which pixels are read in each given dimension. Um, we could, for example, suppose we wanted to squish the picture a bit, we could take all of our reds values, we'll have everything in the uh, rows, everything in the columns, but we'll, uh, well, almost everything in the columns, but we'll just use a stride of three. We'll take every third pixel. Uh, let's plot that and you'll see we have our normal <laughs> image, but it's now uh, rather thinner. Um, it's a third of the width it was, 900 pixels originally. Uh, and again, if we look at squish.strides, you'll see again, this is same number of bytes required to go from a pixel to the same pixel in the next row, but now nine bytes required to go from a pixel to the same, the next pixel in the same, uh, sorry, the next column in the same row, uh, because again, the colors of information is there, so it's three bytes per pixel. Uh, we're only looking at every third pixel now, so it's up to nine bytes. But again, all of this has been done uh, without reusing the memory. So NumPy is generally very good at using these views onto a chunk of memory rather than copying data unless it has, has to. But you do need to remember this, that if you, for example, assign to uh, an array like this, which you can do um, uh, like that, I'm assigning to the essentially the pixel that was here, uh, a value of 128. And if I now look at the original image array, you take it from me, it wasn't 128 before we started. Um, it is now 128 now because these are both changing the same bit of memory. You change one, you change both of them. Now, if you do explicitly want to copy an array rather than use this views uh, method, then um, there are copy methods and various other ways you can do that. And sometimes you want to do that for a whole variety of reasons. Sometimes you may want to arrange your uh, data in particular orders to make sure that um, the caches work well in your process, for example. So you may want to transpose actually to be a copy, a transposed copy, so that the data is read out in an efficient way for your cache. Okay, while we're on the subject of strides, there is some pretty wacky stuff you can do here. 
Let me give you an example. Here is an array of the numbers from 0 to 9. Okay. It is, in this case, a 64-bit integer. And so if we look at the strides, we find that um, you need 8 bytes, 64 bits, to go between each of these elements. Now, there's this library called np.lib.stridetricks uh, and a function called asstrided, which lets you take an array and pretend that its shape is um, something different and you specify the strides that should be used to move between the pixels in uh, or the elements in that array. And so here what I'm going to do is take this 10 element array and convert it into a 7x4 array. How do you do that? There aren't enough elements obviously to, for, to be 7x4. But in actual fact it works. Let's have a look. Okay, that's what you get out. And the reason you get that is we're saying we want seven rows by four columns. Okay, that's what we've got. How do you get from um, the first, uh, this element in this row to this element in this row? You go eight bytes. That just takes you on to the next one here. So, uh, and we say have the same eight bytes as we did have to go um, between the elements in the x direction. So, what this lets you do, if, in fact, is construct an array where that's the first row, that's the second row, that's the third row, and so on. And uh, this, okay, may be a little, uh, little hard to read, but it is quite cute that you can create that array, perfectly valid NumPy array, you can do all sorts of things with it, um, and you're creating it from the same memory that was created with these 10 integers up here. Okay, that's an aside. I wouldn't recommend you necessarily use this unless you have a very good reason to do so, but it gives you an idea of what's happening behind the scenes. Okay, let's go back to the pictures. Right, let's take our whole image and we're going to use the color RGB to gray uh, conversion to turn it into a grayscale image and display it. This is very similar to what we did before, but actually this is slightly better gray conversion um, than simply taking one of the values that we, uh, that we did with our reds in, in the earlier image. Okay. I want to look at a histogram of the pixel values here. I want to know for each of the different pixel values that there could be, how many pixels have that value. And you can use the uh, np.histogram thing. We're giving it the array that has the source data in it. We're saying how many bins we want, 256 in this case, uh, and what the range should be of, those, uh, of the values here. Again, some of these are optional, but you can look at the documentation of the histogram to find out more. Um, and let's look, have a look at the histogram. So here you can see this is basically telling you how many pixels in this image have a value of zero. They're completely black and the answer is zero. Mm. And we can see they ramp up. How many of them are completely white? They have a value of 255. The answer is zero and everything lies in between the two. And then bins, the other thing that's returned from this histogram is the list of the values of the edges of the bins, which in this case is simply the values of from zero uh, to 256. Essentially the bins fall between those values and that's where these these pixel counts come from. Now what we're going to do is for the histogram for this here we're going to do the cumulative sum of the values. So that gives us another array which starts at zero and basically as you go through the, uh, the values are summed up so that in the end you get 461, 700 uh, uh, 461,700, which is the total number of pixels in our image. Let's plot this. Okay, this is not the easiest introduction to matplotlib, but I'll tell you what's going on here. I tell you what, let me not go into too much detail here. I'll highlight the important bits and you can read up uh, in more detail about what some of these things do if you want to. I'm going to draw a bar graph on one axis here um, of the bins uh, uh, that um, uh, this, these are the x coordinates here, and uh, which are basically the right hand values. So at one, we're going to plot essentially the count. So th this is the x coordinate of one. We're going to plot the count of the number of uh, pixels that have a value of one or less. Um, so with the histogram, actually have a value of one. We're going to draw a red bar graph and. And then down here we're going to create a second y-axis and we're going to plot the cumulative distribution function and then we're going to do a couple of different things and we're going to ask matplotlib to show the result and 
you don't need to worry about the details, this is what it looks like. Okay. Uh, you can go back and look at these at your leisure if you want to. So here we have the histogram. This tells us that at a brightness level of 50, we have about, mm, about a thousand pixels that, uh, that actually had that particular brightness level. And because we've got more bright sky and clouds and things here, you can see most of them are actually on the brighter side here. And this is the cumulative version of this function. Slightly different axis, you can see we go from naught here up to the 400 and whatever thousand it was, uh, the number of pixels in the image, and you can see it gets you get steeper gradients here on the places where the, the graphs are higher. Um, now, uh, so that's, that's what's behind this image here. Okay, let's equalize this. You may think that image is a little bit flat and, and unexciting, so we're going to use um, histogram-based equalization here to create this equal image. Let's have a look at that and the original one. I'm using these subplots here to say I want one row by two columns of figures and uh, and then I'm going to use imshow on the separate little subfigures that are returned by that process. That's roughly what's happening. And here's the gray image, which is our original, and here's the equalized image, which is our slightly more arty, gritty version of this, uh, which has been histogram equalized. Well, that's nice, uh, but what was actually happening there? Let's take this and do the same histogram plot that we did before, and now we can see that, let's look at the original histogram like that, we can see that things have been stretched out and shuffled and so on a bit, but the cumulative distribution function has become a straight line. So that's basically what that histogram-based equalization, that particular one does, uh, which is to say, try and spread these out so that the cumulative distribution function, the number of pixels are spread out so um, uh, that the, the values form a straight line here. And so you get this, uh, this rather more gritty um, but better defined contrast version of the image. Now, if that's too gritty for you, so this is an array, that's an array, we can do manipulations on the array. So perhaps we could blend those two. So I'm going to say for i in the range of 0 to 4 here, i goes up to just before 5, I'm going to create a mix, which is going to be a value between 0 and 1. And in that loop, I'm going to take the original image multiplied by that mixture, and I'm going to take the new gray image multiplied by 1 minus that mixture add those two together and so that's going to do it remember with each individual pixel within that image um, and then we're going to show the output here as a grayscale image and you can see here that this is the original one times the original zero times the normalized version and as we gradually add little bits more of the normalized version we subtly get to the point where we end up this is our normalized version which is more gritty and darker blacks here and uh, more detail in the sky and so on and you can decide where in this image you like uh, your maybe here somewhere you your your arty version um, that still contains a certain amount of realism so that's just looking at very simple per element uh, operations on arrays, numpy arrays that we did um, in the earlier sessions but this is uh, this is now in, in the context of images. Okay, let's use our original gray image and make it RGB again. I'm not going to turn it back into color. I've thrown away that information now, but I do want to have RGB for each pixel and uh, they're just all going to be the same value, which will keep it gray. So I'm going to take my, this, if you remember, this is now, this gray image is now 513 by 900 and we want it to be 513 by 900 by 3 where each of those values, those RGB values, is the same as is currently in the grey image. So let's do this. There are several different ways you could do this. We'll look at a couple of them. I'm going to take the height and the width being these values here. I'm then going to create an array of zeros which is uh, of that size, height, width and three values per pixel and the values are all unsigned ints, eight bits as before. Let's do that. So there we've now created an image that's 513 by 900 by three, but it's just full of zeros. So if we assigned the values in that image to be the values in the gray image, then we'd have what we wanted. Now, this I can introduce some new notation here. Um, we can use an ellipsis to say essentially as many dimensions as you need to make this 
makes sense. So I'm taking the zeroth element, essentially the red element of each of the pixels in however many dimensions we've got. We could have done something like yeah, like that. That would have had the same effect, but this dot 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 is just a bit tidier. Uh, so I'm going to assign all of the red values to the same values in the gray image, all of the green values to the same values in the gray image, and the same with the blue. And the result we get then is, let me scroll down, is basically red, 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 uh, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue. You can see the same values in each one. So now I can use him show to show this again, but I don't need to specify the color map because it is a color image. It's just not very exciting colors. There you go. <laughs> it's all gray. Okay, well, you'll see why I want to do this in a moment, but let's look at another way we could have achieved that. Um, and that's using broadcasting, which we saw earlier. So let's take our original gray image again. So this is the 2D version. Uh, and I'm going to create a new 3D version of this by adding a new axis on the end. This is a special value in NumPy, but you can actually just put none here. And this says, take all of the existing dimensions, uh, add another one on the end. And what we now get is a 513 by 900 by one um, uh, array. So it's now a three dimensional array, albeit the third dimension is only a value of one. But because that final value is one, we can use it to do that broadcasting stuff we saw earlier. So we can uh, create a solid, as it were, of an appropriate type and, and swipe this uh, plane across that solid, if you like, to give us that three pixel depth. Now, different ways you could do this, but I'm going to use NumPy Broadcast 2, which is a, um, a handy uh, function that basically says, take this thing, right, our new slightly expanded thing that has, a, has one dimension, um, uh, 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 dimension of one in the third axis, and let's broadcast it to something that is height by width by three pixels. And what we get here is um, essentially the same thing out. It's a mono image that is that has um, the same values uh, in the here because we've kind of taken, as it were, that first column and broadcast it across red, green, and blue here. Uh, and so again, we can produce the output here and we see our gray image here, though it is actually um, treated as color by matplotlib. It's just that all the colors have the same value. So we can change that. Let's put some colors back in here. I'm going to introduce you to another function here. This is the where function. So this uh, says, look at the first argument here where this is true use this value, otherwise use this value. Now, because this is a NumPy thing, it works with arrays. So let's look at all of our mono image values. Where they are greater than 40, um, then we are going to use the value from the original image, the color image. So where they're bright, we're gonna use the value from the original image. And where they're not bright, we're gonna put in a lurid kind of pink here. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is why I'm calling it low lights. We're gonna highlight the places that are dark, essentially with this lurid pink. Let's try it. And you'll see very quickly, we have something that shows us all of the dark bits of the image uh, combined with the colors from the original image uh, in the places where it's light enough. Okay, that's kind of fun. What about the light blues? Suppose we want to capture the bright bits of the sky. I'm gonna do that a slightly different way. So here are uh, the blues in the image, red, green, blue, so the third value here. And we can create a mask saying, uh, let's apply this condition. We want to know where those blues are greater than um, 200. And so this gives us one of these Boolean arrays. Uh, all of those are false, but in the middle there, there are some where actually the blue value is quite bright, and so those would be true. So, in fact, let's look at that. You can see uh, if we plot that using a gray color map, you, could, you basically get white where the value is true and black where the value is false. So we can see which bits we're talking about here. It's the bright blue bits of sky, basically, and some bits of the water. So if you remember, we can use a, uh, a Boolean array as an index into our main array, and we can say, I want to set all of those values where the, essentially all of the values that show up white here to be bright blue here. 
I'm going to make them a sort of lurid blue uh, for anything that's got even a vaguely bright blue component. That doesn't mean it was blue to start with, but it just means that the blue value was high enough. And so let's do that. We can see, and there you get to see uh, highlighted in pink the really dark areas, and highlighted in bright blue all the places where the blue component uh, was sufficiently bright in the original image. So that gives you a quick demo of some of the things we can do making use of some of those techniques with uh, arrays that we saw earlier uh, and hopefully you now understand a little bit more about um, how uh, numpy arrays can represent images and some of the manipulations you can do with them and also the fact that often you're just manipulating the same chunk of memory um, you're not necessarily creating new chunks every time you change the array now we're using matplotlib to draw um, to draw these images here and the graphs that we saw earlier. And matplotlib I've used mostly because it's a sort of de facto standard. It's there, it's, it's available in most of these Python distributions without too much trouble, and it is actually very capable. Um, if you look at this example page on matplotlib.org, you'll find huge numbers of examples to show you that it can do some really quite funky stuff. And uh, there's sample code here which tells you how to do it and it is quite powerful and um, you can have fun with this. However, it is also perhaps not the most self-explanatory or easiest to use, and so there are various other libraries you might like to look at. I quite like Bokeh, for example, which is um, more JavaScript-based, uh, and so it's a bit easier to zoom in and out and crop and so on when you're actually looking at graphs and you want to examine your data more closely. There are things based on Plotly, there are things based on ggplot, for example, there's a library called Plot9, um, and lots of other things you can use uh, to view your data or your images in different ways, but um, Matplotlib does have the advantage for all of its quirkiness that it is uh, actually very powerful and, and widely available. Okay, we're going to leave images there for now, and we're going to take a look at audio. Okay, we're going to do a little bit with some audio here just to illustrate some of the other things you can do with NumPy arrays in case pictures aren't your thing, um, but this is really more to show some of the extra facilities of Jupyter Notebooks. So let's get to work. Oh, and you'll be pleased to hear this does include some Monty Python. Okay, I should emphasize again at this point that we are only really scraping the surface here of the vast range of scientific computing possibilities there are in this, uh, in this Python world. Um, we haven't mentioned things like Scikit-Learn, which is a machine learning platform. We haven't mentioned the SciPy library, which is quite vast and has a whole load of useful functions. I will mention one here, which is um, the loadMat function. This loads MATLAB's uh, data format, in case you have colleagues that, um, that save their data from MATLAB or need to load it, uh, load it from MATLAB, you can exchange data with them using, using these sort of functions. You can have a look at scipy.org for more info. Uh, so here I'm going to uh, just load up our standard modules again, but I am going to use one of the scipy uh, functions, which is uh, WAV file. This is a function that lets you read in WAV data, uh, audio files, and it returns the raw audio data and also the sample rate here. And I can use um, matplotlib to plot the data, and we can see what our audio waveform looks like. But that's not much use. How do we hear what it sounds like? Um, well, I'm going to use this ipython.display module here. I'm going to import that as IPD. And that knows how to display a whole variety of different things within your notebook. So uh, the audio here, I can give it the data that we've just read in, and I can specify the sample rate. And that gives me a little um, playback uh, widget, which will let me play this coconut.wav. You've got two empty jars of coconut, and you're banging them together. There you go, a little Monty Python clip from uh, Michael Palin. Um, right, so how do these things which have a more interesting output in your Jupyter Notebook actually display themselves? Well, standard Python classes use the standard underscore underscore repra underscore underscore method. Really hard to say. Uh, some people call that dunderscore or dunder repra dunder. Uh, so a standard Python list, for example, has a dunder repra dunder method, which returns a string of the contents of the list. And so when we ask Jupyter to evaluate it, that's what gets printed out um, in, after your cell here. Uh, 
But if you, the class that you're looking at, the object that you're looking at, has an underscore repra underscore HTML underscore method, which is even harder to say, uh, then it will use that. So you can create your own classes or augment your existing classes uh, to have one of these, and they'll look pretty in your notebooks. So here's a very simple my list class, which simply takes a list of items and stores them uh, and knows how to display itself in Jupyter uh, by outputting um, a, a list in HTML. So let's define that class. And then I can create a my list item which takes the list Ford Arthur Zaford. And when I ask Jupyter to display it, it looks pretty um, in, the, in the notebook because of its HTML output. So you've got a lot of flexibility in how you display your own objects and it can be much more complex obviously than this. Um, and of course there are lots of things built in that also have a repra HTML method. Uh, IPD has a YouTube video method for example where you give it the IT ID of a YouTube video and um, it will display it in your notebook. No, on second thoughts let's not go to Camelot. It is a silly place. Okay, so um, Lots of room for expansion there. Okay, let's go back to the audio. So, the audio data is just a NumPy array and we can play with it in the same way. So, squeaky data here, we're going to take the original data, but we're going to take every second sample, um, but we're going to play it back at the same sample rate here, so it will sound squeaky. <laughs> If we want to go in the opposite direction, we can slow things down by interpolating. I'm going to use this numpy interp function, interpolating between the original uh, samples uh, to get ones that occur more slowly, a larger number so that they'll play back more slowly. And this interp function takes xp, which is a, essentially a set of uh, x values, and fp, which is a set of floating point y values. That's our original data. And then you tell it the x values where you would like to generate uh, inter intermediate values. And so I'm doing this by going from 0 to the length of the original data, but doing so at a slightly slower rate than just incrementing by 1 each time. And so that gives us a larger amount of data, which I'm going to play back at the same sample rate. You've got two eggs jars of coconut and you're banging them together. Okay, so that's a fast Michael Palin and a slow Michael Palin, but suppose we want a whole crowd of Michael Palins. So I often play around in Jupyter trying out different bits of code and uh, when I get to a certain point where things seem to work, I then turn it into a function and maybe copy that and use it in some other code somewhere. So here's a thing that makes a chorus. You give it some audio data, you give it uh, the number of, uh, of repetitions of this chorus you want, number of simultaneous playbacks, but they may have a bit of a, an offset, randomized value up to this maximum, and uh, played back at some speed between a minimum and maximum multiplier of the original. And so um, I won't go into too much detail here, but you can see an interp command uh, there. You start with a chorus of zeros, and then you go through the chorus size, creating a new sample and basically adding it to the chorus at a random offset. And so I can make a chorus here with particular values and, uh, and display the resulting data, the resulting chorus here, um, using the IPD audio. And then you get several Michael Palins at once. Now that's fun, but if we actually wanted to experiment with those values a bit more, it's a nuisance to keep going in and, uh, and changing them by hand. So we can use this thing called IPy widgets. Now this module gives you some widgets that you can include in IPython or Jupyter notebooks, like for example an integer slider between 0 and 20. Let's display that. And its repra HTML method means that it shows as a slider here, and we can change it. Uh, and actually, if we display it twice in the same notebook, these are cunningly tied together, so um, it keeps those in sync. And we can ask for its value like that. Oh, there you go, scroll up a bit. Um, value of 10, so we can then use that in other calculations. And we can, when you execute a cell, um, the value there will be used. Right, 14 now. So what I'm going to do here is create several of these. 
uh, an integer slider for chorus size, for the maximum offset, for the minimum and maximum uh, speeds. These are float sliders, and there are all sorts of parameters to change how they're displayed and what the limits are and so on. And um, then down at the bottom here, I'm creating a button widget called generate. And when you click that, then it calls this function new chorus. A new chorus will call my make chorus function above, but it will use the values from those various sliders. Uh, and then it'll plot the audio data, and um, then it will also generate a little audio playback thing so I can see what it sounds like. So let's execute this, and what we get is here's my set of sliders. So let's pick our chorus size, make it a bit smaller, make the offset a bit larger, for example. Let's make it quite a bit larger and do generate. And there we get our plot, and here we get our audio playback. Right, and uh, alternatively I can go bigger and I can have more of an offset and I can make them go slower and faster and I can generate again and we get a second graph where you'll see the things smoothed and is a bit longer and if we play it back I think we'll leave that there it is a silly place so just as a little diversion here um, We've been dealing very much with uh, numerical data stored in the computer, but you can interact with the outside world using Jupyter Notebooks as well. And um, if you happen to have, as I have on my desk here, an animatronic head, uh, you can use, say, these sliders, IPy widget sliders, uh, and there are lots of other widgets in IPy, um, in IPy widgets, to uh, control his servos and try and decide what the appropriate values are to generate various facial expressions here. So in this case, the underlying Python called in the notebook is um, sending numbers out on a serial port to control the servers in the, uh, in the robot's face. Uh, and that just shows you that um, you can use Jupyter Notebooks for really interacting with the real world as well, and not just with theoretical numerical data. So we've learned a lot now about NumPy, about how to deal with nice, tidy arrays of numbers at great speed in Python and manipulate them in a variety of interesting ways, whether those numbers represent uh, images or audio or something completely different. But how do you get that data into Python in the first place? Uh, Real-world data is often messy. It often contains uh, mixtures of text and numbers and dates and times and all sorts of other things. And it comes from a whole variety of different places. Excel spreadsheets, CSV files, maybe um, JSON structures that you're downloading from the web. And often the data will be incomplete or it'll need some manipulation before you use it. And that's where Pandas comes in. So we're now going to do a little bit of playing with pandas. Pandas, I'm afraid, this is nothing to do with those cute black and white bears from China. This is the Python numerical data analysis library, and it's a really useful tool for reading, for manipulating, for organizing, for restructuring uh, data that, uh, that comes in from the real world. So let's take a look at it. So let's go into the last of my Jupyter notebooks here, where we talk about pandas. Um, and I'm going to start by importing stuff we've seen before, um, but I'm also going to import pandas as PD. You can just pip install pandas or install it with Anaconda as we discussed before with the other, other libraries. So if I run that, I now have pandas. So again, let's start with the, the basics and let's understand the classes that are available in pandas and what, what's really happening under the hood as it were. So the most basic class really is a series. A pandas series is a lot like a NumPy array. So we can create one with a list of data like this. There is a pandas series. And we can slice it just like an array, a Python array or a NumPy array, and get, um, the, get the values out, as we would expect. But the key thing to note here is that there are index numbers down the side here when we display this. So by default, if you don't specify them, the indices will be numbers starting at zero, just like a regular Python array. Uh, 
However, they don't have to be. They can be all sorts of different things. So here I'm going to construct the same series, but I'm going to tell it that the index should actually be Alex, Bob, Charles and Diana. Let's have a look at that. And here you can see basically the same values, but those are now the indexes. So rather than asking for a particular numbered index, we can ask for uh, the value for Charles. So this is a bit more like a dict in Python. Um, we can even do things like slice from Alex, Alice to Charles uh, with a, a stride of two, and then we get just those values out. So a Python series has this thing called an index, and you can ask for it here, and it tells you that this is an index um, which has those values in it. But it also has a set of values which is basically the same as a NumPy array in this case, very, very similar underlying structures anyway. So we can do things, let's construct a series here which are just some numbers I found online for populations of some of the larger cities in the UK. And um, so as we've said, this is a lot like a Python dict. We can, for example, ask for the keys and the values of it like this. So those are the keys. Um, and, uh, and it will behave in some ways like a Python dict, but it does have a lot of the power of NumPy arrays. Oh, also, of course, Python dicts until the very most recent versions of Python um, were not ordered. You would put things in, but the order wasn't guaranteed, whereas here you do know in a, in a um, Panda series that they, that order will be maintained. Now, we can also do a lot of the things with a series that we might do with a NumPy array, like apply simple operations to them and these apply on all the elements of the series. So if we want to see what those numbers are in millions, uh, we can divide by a million and this tells us London is eight and a bit million, Birmingham's one and a bit million and the others are all about half a million here. Um, we can, uh, for example, ask for the standard deviation of those numbers of millions and that says, uh, for example, so that takes all of these values and works out the standard deviation. Um, this, I can't remember if we mentioned this is a useful function before, this tells you the index of the, uh, the item with the maximum value here in populations, so that's London, um, because this is the largest value. And we can also do the kind of um, selecting by Boolean operations, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, that we did with uh, with NumPy arrays. So, for example, I can say, show me all of the populations uh, where the value is gr where the value of populations is greater than one million, uh, and that'll show me London and Birmingham. So it's a bit like, as we mentioned before, in SQL. If you're familiar with SQL, select star from populations where value is greater than a million. It's something like that. Now here's a separate series, some different figures I found on a different site, which tells you what the gender ratio is, or what percentage of the population is male in each of these cities. So we can create a, a series like that, and we can do operations like say, okay, well if that's uh, the men, then what's the percentage of women in each of those cities? And um, uh, if we wanted to work out the total populations based on those numbers, so how many women are there based on that percentage, so we take 100 minus the male percent, um, we divide that by 100 because it's a percentage, and we multiply that by the population, and that will tell us some interesting numbers. Now, something quite clever happened there. You notice these are actually two different, um, two different sources of data, but some of the indices line up. So for the percentages, we have London, Birmingham, Leeds, Glasgow, Bristol. For the population, we have London, Birmingham, Glasgow, Liverpool, Bristol. And so it has noticed that we do not have complete information for Leeds and Liverpool, and so it's given us not a number here. It knows it can't deal with that. It doesn't die throwing an error. It just says, sorry, this is data I don't have, and leaves a convenient break. Um, it's also lined up the correct values here. So even though some of these things were in different orders in our original data set, it's worked out that, okay, you're interested in the male percentage from Glasgow and the population from Glasgow. And it's done a sort of join type query on those to give you the information it can, despite the fact you're presenting it with somewhat incomplete and mismatched data. Uh, it's showing this in this uh, exponent form here. But if we wanted a tidier output of this, we could ask for the female populations where the value is not null. That means it's not one of these NAN values. Uh, 
and we'd like that displayed as type integer. And then we get nice numbers for how many women there are in each of those cities. So that's just an example of what you can do with a series. And that's an important underlying class, but there's a more powerful one. And a lot of the work you'll do in Pandas revolves around data frames. So data frames are kind of like two-dimensional series. You have a column, which is a series of data, and you have an index into that data, just like we've got now, but you also have a column index to allow you to identify the columns. That's basically how data frames are constructed. So let's pick an example here. I'm going to read in an Excel spreadsheet. Pandas has lots of lovely uh, functions for reading in various different formats. There are lots of options here, which I don't really need. Uh, but spreadsheets, of course, can contain multiple pages. Um, so I'm going to pick the particular sheet that I want, which is called Landmarks. And let's just read that in. And there we have uh, it's read in the columns, it's given them their names, uh, and it's read in the rows. And it knows, by the way, only to display a sensible number of these, even though there are actually 10,000 rows in here. Pandas can cope very well with very large numbers of data. 10,000 is not huge, but it would make Excel start to complain a bit on some machines. And uh, you can go significantly larger than that in Pandas without having any problems. Um, so. If you just want to look at the first few rows, we've got this head function, which will show you the first five by default. You can change that by putting a number in here. There's a tail function that's similar. And we can ask a data frame what its columns are, and we get out another index, which is basically the horizontal row here. The, the origin of this, by the way, this is from video frames where we are recognizing facial landmarks. So these X and Y coordinates, I've just picked a subset here because in the original there are the dozens if not hundreds of columns. Um, these are the X and Y coordinates of particular features on the face which we are taking from individual frames of video uh, and it, at 30 frames a second. So these are the timestamps in seconds of each frame. And the confidence here is what our recognition engine tells us how confident it is that it's actually found a face and, and got these, uh, these um, landmarks in the right place. So we've looked at the columns here. That's an index that goes that way. We can look at the index, this one down here, uh, which is could be an index of integers. In fact, there's a shortcut, the special more efficient range index, which is if you know that you're going in integer steps from 0 to 10,000, um, then it uses a range index rather than actually enumerating all of the values. But you can still go into one of those and say, I'd like the 13th item, please. It goes from 0. So. Um, the, the 13th item of the index is 12. Now, here is an important thing, a very important thing to remember in data frames, which confused me for a while. And that is that if you index into a data frame, the first axis that you get here is columns, it's not rows. And this is particularly important if you've come from NumPy, where normally a NumPy array, you do rows as the first axis, columns as the second. Um, in a data frame, you're interested in columns often primarily, and particularly if you look at the structure here, you can see that this is sort of the way things are organized under the hood. So um, if you index into a data frame, the first thing you're doing is saying which column are you interested in. That is important, and it can be confusing until you get used to it. So for example, one of those columns was called confidence here. And if I ask for confidence in the data frame, I get back a series of those values again with the index values down the side and we can actually look what is the type of, of, of the thing I get back it is actually a pandas series so that's basically what you're getting now we can ask for the values and we can perform operations on them like tell me the mean value here of the confidence um, and actually often you don't need to say I want the values you can just say apply these this function to the column as a whole and that will do the same thing you can also split it by um, uh, using a range, as we expect here. So that gives me items 23 to 25. Um, and uh, But you notice that the thing you get here is a series. You still get back a series. And so you do need to respect the indexes here, which are still valid indexes. So if you want the first value in this series, you do need to say you want item 23. <laughs> 
because that's the index that's looking here. It's not item zero. So uh, just because uh, you've picked, you've selected this subset, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the index is going to start from zero. Those indexes may have important meanings of their own, and we'll see an example of that later. So if I do that, that gives me the first value here. Um, now, if the column name is suitable, i.e. it doesn't have any spaces or funny punctuations in, as a shortcut you can write it like this, as if it were an attribute on, on the data frame model, so we can ask for the maximum value of the confidence doing that. You'll see both syntaxes. This one is a little bit more wordy, but it's safe because you can always use this. Sometimes that can clash with other attributes or, or, or functions. Um, but it is convenient if you're just doing quick stuff for yourself. We can also pass in a list here. So for example, these are you know three names of columns here in a list. If we pass that to data frame, to the data frame and, and ask for the head, the first few values, then we just get those columns and the first five elements displayed. And there's a useful function on a data frame called describe, which will basically for each of the columns, it will tell you how many items there are. It'll tell you what the mean is, the standard deviation, the minimum and maximum, and the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile. So that's quite a useful way of getting a feel for the data if you just don't know, um, you know what's in there and what the range of values might be. Okay, now let's look at something I'm sorry to do this again early before we've you know had a chance to play with some of this, but it's a it is a potential source of confusion here, um, and so I think it's worth introducing it early. So we've said that data frames are indexed by the columns, um, and in fact you can treat it like a Python dict. You can ask for its keys, and you get back the list of the column names. That's fine. What you can't normally do is ask for df0. You might think that that would give you the first row, um, but it doesn't because we're looking at columns here. So uh, there could be a column actually named zero. It's perfectly valid, right? The horizontal index could be, uh, could be integers, and this would be a perfectly valid thing to request. But you will never get back a row by asking for df0. You will get a row, you will get a column. There is a special attribute that you can use to get rows by numbers, and it's iloc, integer location. And so if I ask for iloc2, what I get back is a series for that particular row, the third row in this case, in, in the uh, data frame. And it's a series which is indexed by the column names. So you can say, uh, I want the time, the timestamp from the third row, and that will give you a value back. But this is important to remember. Now, you can also uh, give other things to iloc, for example, a slice, and uh, so we're going from 20th item before the end, right up to the end in steps of two, and that gives you back a data frame um, of those last few items uh, every other row, as we would expect. Now, here's where the, the caution comes in. Because slicing a few rows like this is very common, you can index into a data frame using a slice like this, and it will actually return those rows as a data frame as you might expect. So let's go df0 colon 10, and you can see that we are doing what we would expect here. That's despite the fact that I said that uh, the first thing you get is columns, but uh, this is a shortcut. If, um, uh, if, if what's in here is a slice, then you can actually use that to index into a data frame. Um, now, it's important to notice these are index values in here, so um, the, these are not necessarily numbers, so the, you might be saying I want to slice from March to September or something like that, uh, but they may often be in uh, integer indices, so this will work. Okay. So why am I emphasizing this? Because it is different from NumPy arrays and it's different from Python arrays and it can be confusing. You can use df colon 10, for example, to, oh, sorry, I keep uh, <laughs> double clicking in here. You can use df colon 10 to refer to the first 10 rows if they have integer indices, but you can't use df zero to refer to the first row. It's only slices that will, that will give you uh, this shortcut to get um, a, a data frame uh, chunk out. Um, and df0 will sometimes work, but it'll give you a column <laughs> if you have a column named 0. So that is something you just have to get used to. And they are both, it's a handy feature, and it does make some sense. So if you imagine you've got a Python list, uh, 
and you index it with an integer, so you say I want the third thing in the list, then you get back the thing that is in the list at that point. Whereas if you slice it, you get back another list. Uh, and so you could argue this is doing the same thing. If you slice a data frame, you get back another data frame. If you, uh, if you use an index, then you get the thing that's sort of in there, but it's indexed by columns anyway. So here's a little quiz. What will this do? If I say if df is my data frame, I want to say for p in df sliced up to colon 5 print p. What do you think that's going to do? I'll let you think about it for a moment and let's run it. It gives me the columns. Okay, why does that happen? I said that you could slice a data frame using uh, using a slice as opposed to an individual index and it would give you back rows and that is quite correct but what it gives you back is a data frame of the rows so if you then say for p in that data frame what you get back is the columns of that data frame uh, and so you actually get back a list of column names uh, df colon 5 is a chunk of df uh, but it is a data frame and then you're iterating through it okay so are we happy with that? Don't worry if you didn't get all of that, you can go back and watch this again. Um, but it is important just to be aware that sometimes until you get used to it, and it doesn't take too long to get used to it, until you get used to it, um, then exactly what happens when you index after a data, uh, data frame here, normally that's going to be the name of a column or perhaps a list of columns, but it can be a slice of, um, of, of the rows and then you'll get back a data frame containing those rows. Now we can also do the uh, Boolean indices thing as well as we, uh, as we saw in NumPy arrays. So for example, if I ask for the data frame, confidence is where, where it's greater than uh, 0.96, for example, that gives me back a series, which is uh, Boolean values of all the rows, basically where, where that's true. And so I can use that as well as an index into the data frame in the similar way to a slice. And this will give me back a data frame where all the values are greater than 0.96. Uh, this is very useful. Right, so let's have a look at, uh, at using this in, in, uh, for some real experiments. So in the computer lab, the Department of Computer Science and Technology, as we now call ourselves in the University of Cambridge, we have a weather station on the roof. This has been here for a very long time, and it can produce little outputs like this, showing you various uh, weather statistics. But the data is collated each night into uh, some downloadable files, which you can find at this URL. And... I'm going to use pandas's read CSV file, uh, read CSV function, um, which can read a CSV normally from a local file, but in this case I'm going to do it from a URL. And often, you may know, CSV files uh, have as the first row um, the list of header names. Now this sadly doesn't have that, so I'm specifying header is none here, so we'll just get the values without any useful header names like this. There you go. The rows are just called 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 9. And you can see here we've got a mix of data, actually. First we've got the index. Then we've got um, the, the date and time of the reading. So these go back to 1995 here, um, quite a long way. And, um, uh, and we have various columns here. Now, I happen to know, if I go and look up on the site, what those various columns are. Um, and you can see, by the way, there's 411,000 of those, which we read in nice and easily with one single command. Um, so at the moment, uh, the columns don't have names, but we can still refer to them as numbers. There's column zero, right, which is a list of strings at the moment. Now, all of these functions have lots of arguments that let you do clever things with them. So first of all, I'm going to use the same read CSV file here, but actually I'm going to specify the names of the columns because I know what they are. They're the timestamp. They're things like the temperature in deci celsius in tenths of celsius here i think the original system liked outputting integers uh, and so most of these things are you know um, multiplications of the values here so temperature multiplied by 10 to give it a sensible integer value the dew point um, the wind speed in tenths of a knot and so forth and so um I'm also going to tell it that actually the column called timestamp, I'd like it to try and parse that as a date, this thing, this string here, and, uh, and then let's have a look at what we get the first 10 rows, and we get back 
uh, nicely labeled columns that we can do things with and these even though you can't see it here are actually uh, date times if I uh, ask the data frame for its data types it tells me for each column what it's actually storing here and this is a 64-bit date time so I can ask for the the top few entries of that uh, and it will show they still look like strings as it happens they still look the same format that's the default printout format but you can actually do different things with um, date manipulations on here and we'll come back to that um, so I can, for example, ask the data frame for the first 10,000 temperature measurements uh, and plot them. Let's try that. And there we have it. Now these are temperature DC, these are deci Celsius, these are tenths of a degree. So we're talking about a temperature here that goes down to about minus 5 and up to a little bit over 30, maybe 32 um, here from those first 10,000 figures. Remember we've got 400,000 here, so there's plenty to play with. Now you can easily add columns to your data frame, you just have to define them. So here I'm going to define one called temperature, which is that, uh, that temperature times 10 divided by 10. So that actually gets it back into Celsius. I'm going to do the same for all of these ones that are in funny units. Um, the rainfall in millimeters is going to be the rainfall in micrometers divided by a thousand and so forth. Let's have a look at that and you'll see we have our original columns which go up to here but then we start getting temperature, dew point, mean, mean wind in knots and things like that in more sensible values. So um, that's the first manipulation we've done, create ourselves new versions of the existing columns that are in a format that we like. The second thing here, we're just showing the tail here at the end, uh, you can see the indexes are still integers. Now in actual fact we've got good timestamps for all of this data, it would be more useful if that were the integer and we could manipulate things in terms of time. So I'm going to call this thing which basically says tell this data frame to use the timestamp column as the index. Now um, I'll come back to this uh, in place in a sec, but if I just run that, you can see now the timestamp column has become the index, and uh, uh, which is much more useful. Now let's look, take a look at that. We can see that it's basically a date time index that goes um, from uh, the 30th of June 1995 right up to the date when I'm doing this. Now it is important to notice that in place here on my in, in my function. So some of the functions have uh, names like set index, and you'd think that might directly manipulate the uh, the data frame. In fact, it doesn't. What it does is it returns you a new data frame indexed on the timestamp. And so if you do df dot set index just like that and uh, you, you'll find that nothing's happened because the value it actually returns uh, the value as a new data frame and you're still looking at the old one so you can use in place equals true if you say no I actually want to do this to df itself it's, it's sort of the equivalent of um, uh, df equals that okay so you could you could do you could do that too I'll return that to where it was there Right, so we've got our index of date times here, and so we can actually ask, for example, for the humidity at a particular date and time. This is the humidity at um, 9.30 in the evening on the 8th of November 2018. Uh, as it happens, because the system is clever, we can use a string here and it works out that this is a date, but you can also be more explicit because these things are really indexed by date. We could do the same thing by creating a date time structure. And asking for it that way. We can also request the so we're requesting a column here and then asking for the value in that column that's got this index but we could also do it the other way around we could ask for the row that's at this particular time and then ask for the humidity component. Now remember normally the first index is the column and so um, if we want to say actually we were using this to look for rows, we have to use um, a, a separate attribute to do that. We saw iloc earlier, which is the integer location if you want to ask for the nth row, but this is not actually integers and so we use the lock function here uh, to tell me, get me the row at a particular location using this, this index and, um, uh, and then ask for the humidity and that will give us the same value back. So ask for the column then ask for the index or use dot lock to specify or dot i lock to specify the index which row you want and then ask for the appropriate column these will both work 
um, here. Okay, let's have a look at plotting some of these values. So let's go back to the original data frame. We're going to ask for the temperature and we're going to plot it. There it is. Uh, now, notice that the system, matplotlib and, and pandas work together nicely, so it understands that these are dates across here. It does sensible things with them. Notice we have some very dubious looking values here. I think there was a little bit of a glitch in the system and, um, uh, and we, we don't normally get temperatures anywhere close to minus 40 in the eastern part of England. Um, we'll come back to that in a sec. Let's try uh, plotting two different things here. We can plot the temperature and the rainfall. Um, notice this is running nice and fast despite the fact there are 400,000 of these points uh, uh, in each of those plots. Now that's clearly an anomaly. We'd like to get rid of it. In fact, I'm not really. I'm, I just want some good data to play with here. So we can see roughly when that is. I'm going to ignore all of the data after September 2015. So I can just use standard slicing here. So I can say, there's my data frame. Remember, a slice will give me um, the rows of the data frame uh, as you would expect. The index here, however, is a date time rather than uh, integer. So I can say, basically, give me all the bits of the data frame up to that index value and just plot that. And then we'll see we get rid of uh, that funny um, uh, abnormality there. That gives me some nice clean data to start playing with. Let's ask some questions about it. So df.temp.max, uh, uh, we can ask what is the maximum temperature we see and, um, and what's the index at which that temperature occurs. And let's do the same with the minimum in this modified df where we've chopped off the dodgy data. And we can see here that the maximum temperature is 38.3, which is really very hot for the UK. And that happened uh, at 3.30 on the 6th of August 2003, which is there. And you can see the minimum temperature is minus 13, which is also pretty cold for here. And that happened um, on the 11th of February 2012 uh, at 7 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. We can see that those are fairly extreme by asking, for example, the 99th uh, percentile um, value of the of the temperature which is 26 degrees so you can see that going up to 38 is really very unusual. Um, we could ask for example how long was it between that minimum value and that maximum value here. We can subtract the index values and they are both date times so what we get back is a time delta which is um, a little bit over 3110 days. Um, we could ask some more information about the data frame like this. This tells us uh, how many entries there are and uh, it tells us uh, what each of those entries are and um, that it's got a date time index here. Um, we can also do, we've done very simple line charts so far, um, but let's plot a scatter graph here. Um, so I'm just going to say, again, I'm calling this method on the data frame. I'm telling it to plot a scatter chart and the X value comes from the mean wind in knots um, column and the Y value uh, is the temperature. And if we plot that, ooh, we get something quite interesting here. So what this is showing me is that when the wind speed is low, we have a high variation of temperature. Remember, this is going over a 23, 24 year period. And um, and around about freezing, we uh, sorry, sorry, at very low wind speeds, we get a wide range of temperatures. Or to put it another way, you can have a low wind speed at almost every temperature. However, um, these high wind speeds we, uh, we don't tend to get those when it's either very cold or when it's very hot. We only get them when we're, you know, roughly in the sort of middle 10 degrees-ish kind of uh, values. So that's kind of an interesting thing to know. What else might we plot here? Well, let's ask for the temperatures. And we can... I'm going to do a Boolean, val a Boolean index into those where I'm saying where the hour is zero, right? So these are all the values basically that occur between, um, uh, between zero and one o'clock in the morning. And to be clear here, I'm asking for the data frame. I'm asking for the index, which is a date time index. I can ask for the hour value from each date time and say when that's equal to zero. Uh, so this will give me a Boolean uh, list. 
This I can use to index into the range of temperatures and that will give me um, all of the values around just after midnight basically. And I'm going to take a subset of those just uh, so the plot's easier to see and draw those and I'll do the same thing for you know round about two to three in the afternoon. And we draw those and you can see here we get two nice plots and um, the blue one is the time around midnight and the, uh, and the orange one is the time in the middle of the afternoon. Not surprisingly, it's higher, but you might just be able to make out, I should really have made this graph a bit bigger, that the difference is more during the summer than it is in the winter. That actually, um, as a rough approximation, you could do more detailed analysis, but as a rough approximation, the temperatures uh, in the middle of the afternoon and in the middle of the night are closer in winter than they are in summer here. Um, so, okay, but suppose you want, that, that looks right, suppose you wanted to do a bit more detailed analysis of, of, of some of these temperature variations. There's a very handy function called group by, um, which is a, uh, a little bit counterintuitive, so let me explain what it does. So as we've discovered, we can ask for hours or months or days or whatever uh, from a, a date time index, and we get back another index, which is those appropriate values. Um, again, it's nice and fast, this, that was 350,000 values, it just gave us like that. So group by is a function on a data frame, and you can say I want to group by some value in the data frame or in the index, and it returns a thing called a data frame group by object, that's not really very helpful, that doesn't tell you anything at all about what month grouper is or can do. So what's actually happening here? Well, let's look at uh, month grouper has a thing called groups. And if we take a look at that, we can see that it's actually a sort of dictionary mapping the month values that we're indexing by here onto an index um, of all of the entries where that month is that value. So here you can see we have January figures going from 1996 to 2015. Here we have February figures going from 1996 to 2015 and so on. So that's what's in monthgrouper.groups. It's essentially a dictionary mapping uh, individual values to the indexes of the entries that have those. If you go back to the month grouper object then, you can iterate through it showing um, uh, getting out of it that index value and the data frame that has these index values. So what you basically get is for each month you get a data frame just referring to entries that came from that month of the year. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the group frame, take that subset data frame, get the temperature from it, plot that, uh, give it a label of the month uh, uh, with the month and um, uh, and then plot that for each of the months and what we get out is this isn't that pretty now you know I'm going to go here and I'm just going to run this again here and let's make these graphs a bit bigger there we are, I've got it there, plot that there you go, that's easier to see so what's happened here is we've gone through with the Januaries and we've taken all the values that are in the Januaries and we've plotted the temperatures. Remember the, that sub uh, data frame here does still have a date time index and so it will still be plotted across across the date for time thing. And the Januaries are going to be plotted in this darkish blue and they're sort of a bit hidden here. Um, but uh, they're probably at the back there. And, um, and so they're a little bit hard to see, but by the time we get through to the uh, orangey uh, Decembers, you can see clearly the orangey ones at the front. Confusingly, February is also a kind of orange, so we get a little bit of a, an overlap there. But you can basically see the range of temperatures here in each month of the year, and you can also see that we clearly had some sort of problem with our data gathering uh, just before 2002, um, because anything that's just below zero here, maybe it was something was freezing up, uh, but it clearly isn't working very well, or perhaps there was a glitch in the software back there. So sometimes looking at the data in a variety of different ways can help you see these anomalies. But overall, you can see uh, the kind of pattern here um, that uh, that we're getting uh, for temperatures during the month. Um, that's a little bit tricky to see. Let's go in and plot maybe the first um, 10,000 values in each of those columns, uh, and that may actually be a little easier to... There you go. 
it's a bit easier to see here. Um, so we can still see our anomaly, we can see pretty much where it was fixed, uh, but we can also now see a little bit more clearly the uh, December and February values here uh, as two separate, maybe slightly different shades of orange, I'm not quite sure. Um, now we can also for uh, perform various functions on that grouper object. Um, for example, I can ask it for the mean values and it will tell me uh, for each of its entries, each of its month numbers, it will tell me the mean values of each of the columns uh, in that month. So here you can see, for example, at the beginning and the end of the year, here our temperature is averaging throughout the day and night around 4.6 degrees and again goes up to about 18.3 in the middle of the summer. Let's do um, one more variation of this. That chart that we saw earlier, which was a plot of temperature against wind speed, I'm going to do that now for each individual month. And what we get back is lots of lovely charts here. And as we scroll through them, you can kind of see how this pattern changes. It's slightly interesting here. So in uh, the December, you can see here we have this, you know, variation in, in wind speed here um, as the temperature gets a little bit higher, but very little variation um, when the temperatures are low. And the shape of that chart, of that graph, varies when we go back in sort of to the middle of the year. It's much more balanced like this and uh, you get lower wind speeds at both high temperatures in the summer and low temperatures in the summer. And in uh, August, you know, the maximum variation in wind speeds seem to be around the, um, uh, around the sort of 20 degrees mark here. So that maybe gives us some insights uh, that you wouldn't have got just by looking at, uh, looking at the data yourself and maybe gives you some insights that would have been quite hard to come up with, say, if you're plotting it in an Excel spreadsheet. Right, there is a huge amount more that you can do with pandas. I've really only just scraped the surface, but to give you a little bit of an idea here, the particular value of it is taking in data from one or more sources that may be in, uh, in slightly varied formats and may have some bits missing, and, um, and combining that data, merging that data, manipulating that data so that you can then use it in other parts of the Python ecosystem that you now know so much about. So. Just a reminder, we've come to a close now, reminder that these notebooks are available here on GitHub if you want to get them and try them yourself. But I also suggest if you want a little inspiration, do a Google for a gallery of interesting Jupyter notebooks and you will find a huge amount of information showing what people have done, including entire books on particular topics which are basically written as Jupyter notebooks. And you'll find some of these are really, really pretty, really inventive, really enlightening, and can be a great basis to give you ideas for some of the stuff that you can do here. I won't burrow into them, I'll leave those uh, for you to explore. So thank you so much for watching. I hope this has been useful. I hope you've given, it's given you a nice firm grounding in this and I hope you have fun and go on to do some really good experiments in the scientific pandas Jupiter NumPy world uh, and that you have as much fun with it as I do.